Welcome to Decred In Depth, your source for all things Decred. I'm your host, Angelo. And on today's show, I'm interviewing Placeholder VC partner, Joel Monegro. Joel is currently managing Placeholder VC with partner Chris Berniski. I hope you enjoy this conversation as we dig into the crypto VC model and Placeholder's investment thesis for Decred. I'm here with none other than Joel Monegro of Placeholder VC. Joel, how are you doing? I'm doing fantastic. So let's get right into it. Um, what is your background in Genesis into the cryptocurrency space? So it, it all started um, probably around 2013. Uh, I was in the Dominican Republic where I'm from and I was working for the government there. I was in charge of a department called the Digital Economy Department. And one of our mandates was to work on payment system reform. And uh, I, had, I ended up there after trying to get a digital payments company off the ground into the DR, trying to kind of build Stripe for Latin America, and ran into a bunch of obstacles, um, mostly uh, due to the disintegration of the financial system in Latin America, which makes digital payments very difficult. Um, so I ended up at the government after that company didn't work out, and I'm trying to figure this problem out and realize that uh, we have this kind of structural issue with the financial system, started looking for a technological solution to that problem and uh, bumped into Bitcoin and uh, blew my mind, um, did a bunch of work on it. After a year, I got tired of working for the government and I came to New York to work for Union Square Ventures, where I focused on crypto pretty much full time. Nice. Union Square Ventures, that is Fred Wilson, correct? That's right. Got it. So now, you're and a bunch of other people, but Fred is, is right. very popular. <laughs> yes. So now you're at Placeholder with Chris. That's right. Want to go into a little bit about what you guys do exactly? Absolutely. Um, so I joined USV in 2014, um, which is a venture capital fund. Um, and I was there for three years uh, until 2017 when um, the crypto markets were really starting to heat up. Um, Chris joined a firm called ARK Invest also in 2014, which is a, a public asset management firm. They, they manage technology ETFs uh, under Kathy Wood, um, who's Chris's former boss and one of our investors at Placeholder. And um, Chris came up more in a public markets environment in technology, but public markets investing. I came up in venture capital, which is private equity. We don't really deal with public markets all that much. But in 2016, when Chris and I met, we started to see this convergence in crypto that we had these early stage teams, early stage companies launching these new kinds of networks um, with assets that were trading in markets. And so it was this kind of hybrid between early stage venture risk and public market investing in a way. Um, so Chris and I formed a quick friendship uh, and our skills were very complementary. We had the same conviction about uh, the assets, the, the crypto assets that we were building on, on blockchains. Um, and over, over the year uh, between 2016 and, and 2017, uh, after we saw the wave of hedge funds start to come to market, we realized that there was an opportunity for a venture fund focused on crypto. And so that's why we started Placeholder. So how would you compare a traditional hedge fund to a VC hedge fund? I think the, the main difference, there's lots of difference in, in, in terms of fund structure, in terms of how fund managers are compensated. But the main difference, I think, comes from how the portfolio is managed, or at least the difference that I think is most relevant to entrepreneurs and uh, people in the crypto community. Uh, a hedge fund is, is pretty much designed to, to trade actively. Uh, in, in some way. And different hedge funds have different styles of investing, and so it's hard to make a blanket statement. Um, but by and large, a hedge fund is designed to be active in the market, to be buying and selling and profiting from buying and selling. Um, and the other big difference is that a hedge fund is a more liquid structure for its investors, meaning that investors in a hedge fund typically can pull their money at a certain cadence, um, and they have a right to do that. Um, and so that means that hedge funds are um, uh, a little more volatile um, and more liable to the whims of their investors. A venture fund is, is designed to make long-term investments. And so 
Uh, venture, venture funds tend to use a structure called committed capital, which means that investors who commit to a venture fund, they commit for a period of time, uh, in our case, 10 years, and that's a common time frame for a venture fund. And investors cannot withdraw their money from the fund, which really gives the managers of a venture fund the latitude to make uh, long-term bets. Um, and when it comes to crypto, it, it shows up in the way that we invest in the market. We have never sold anything uh, to date. Granted, we've only been uh, in business for about a year and a half, um, but we're, we're designed to build large positions over time um, and exit them over time as well, as opposed to buying and selling with market fluctuations. Understood. Now, I know that placeholders are very selective with the projects that they invest in. So how do you determine... What projects are added to the fund? So that's um, that's a mixture of art and science, um, and, and it, it comes back to our identity as a venture fund. Um, it's we're we're a pretty small firm um, by headcount, um, and the the number one thing is uh, what do we want to work on? Um, mostly, uh, uh, Chris and I, and Brad Burnham, who's one of the co-founders of USB, who's a venture partner at Placeholder. Uh, we all came to this space out of an interest in decentralizing data, wealth, and power. And that's the lens through which we see crypto. Um, and there's a lot of opportunities out there. There's lots of things you can invest in. And sometimes we pass on things that we like. Um, but we come down to what do we personally want to work on because then that dictates how involved we'll each get into each project. So that's the number one thing that, that we look for. And then the, the other more kind of mechanical things that we consider are things like stage, um, uh, how much are we investing or how much is available to invest, um, how do we construct the portfolio, then that's more kind of on the fund management side. Um, but most of all, we focus on the things that we're personally interested in because then that means that we'll be um, more involved in that project rather than just investing passively. Okay, now let me ask you, how is investing in open source projects different than investing in startups? Well, there's, there's a lot of um, differences that, um, that we've observed, just, or at least me moving from uh, traditional venture capital to now crypto venture capital. And the first difference is the liquidity of the asset. In, in traditional venture capital, you invest in, in the private equity of a business and you're pretty much locked in for five to seven years until the company gets acquired or goes public. Uh, here, you, you're investing in, in a public asset, which you can pretty much sell at any time, um, you know, depending on how you acquired it. And that's completely new to me. Um, I was trained in a traditional venture model, and this is where uh, Chris, coming from a public markets uh, uh, training, um, kind of adds some uh, knowledge and insight to that, to that difference. Um, but that, I would say, is the, the biggest difference. What would be a potential exit strategy if a project was to fail or does not meet the expectations of the fund? I don't know. And, and the reason I don't know, uh, and I say that with a smile on my face because it, it's what makes this job very interesting, is that going back to that distinction between investing in, in or holding liquid assets and uh, holding private equity is that in, in VC, you're, you're kind of locked in. You know, things either go to zero or you know, they do fine or they do extremely well. But it's actually a feature of venture capital that you can't get out of the investments. And this often doesn't show up in the news, but there's, there's a lot of startup drama and, and volatility at, in early stage investment, investing. And that doesn't really show up in the price of the stock of a company, of a private company, because you're doing fundraises every 12 to 24 months. And, you know, there, there's nothing that tells you in between that time frame, you know, there's not that volatility that you see in crypto. Um, and so sometimes in venture, you end up with uh, companies that are doing really, really badly for a period of time. Maybe there's some, you know, founder drama or some... Uh, kind of company drama or some market dynamics, but then uh, you can't get out, so you kind of keep supporting the company, and then they turn around the ship, and then they do really well. That happens more often than people realize. And so here, it, I think one of the difficulties is maintaining conviction when you have a liquid asset and you can get out. And so uh, this is where our fund structure is very useful. We don't have um, a, a 
a pressure to get out of investments uh, when they're doing poorly because of you know investors wanting to get out of the fund or because we want to increase our profits for the next quarter because that doesn't that's not something that is a factor in a venture fund. So we really get the opportunity to sit down and um, go for the long haul in these investments. And this is kind of a long-winded way of saying, you know, I don't, I don't really have an exit strategy. Uh, we don't really have an exit strategy when, when we make these investments. We approach them as venture investors. We, uh, we make every investment with as much conviction as, as we can gather. And how are you valuing these crypto assets before adding them to placeholder? Um, it depends. Um, and it depends on at the stage at which we're investing. Um, so if we're investing in an asset that uh, or a network that is public and has been operating for a while, then we can do a lot of, of work um, in uh, understanding the fundamentals of that network and the fundamentals of that service. And so uh, our researchers uh, here at Placeholder, Alex Evans, who focuses on crypto economics, and Mario Lau, who focuses on governance, uh, will help us do a lot of due diligence and will investigate things like the community, things like you know, transaction volumes, if it, you know, we're, applic- we're applicable. We'll g- get a general sense of the traction. Um, and then we'll We'll do, it depends on, on, on the investment, we'll do different uh, things to ascertain what we think the fair value of that network is. Um, we might run comps analyses, we might run some fundamental analyses and so on. In the case of earlier stage projects or companies where, for example, you may have a seed stage company that will release a crypto network in the future, but you know it's 12 to 24 months out, um, then you're running into more traditional venture style investing where early on you don't know what the value of, of these companies are and so you you kind of price it at, at a at a seed stage valuation more that looks more like traditional venture capital um, and so there it depends on the quality of the team and you know the the size of the opportunity the conviction that you have on this team to execute and so on and and what are some of the anxiety reducing qualities as an investor you look for <laughs> In crypto assets. Well, if you want to reduce your anxieties, you shouldn't be a crypto investor. Um, <laughs> I can agree. Um, but the the number one would be team. Um, and uh, there's a there's a, a lesson that I learned from from Brad, uh, which is uh, when you're walking into uncertainty, you want to walk in with people that you're certain about. Um, and so, you, and, and then also when you when you pick the right team and it's people that that you like and uh, that you have a good working relationship with, you know when you step back, um, it it just makes it more fun. It's just you know it, it it's better. Uh, and so even if it doesn't go your way, you're still grateful and happy for having that experience. And so it it it's almost always a good bet to bet on team. And what are some of the qualities you look for within the team or the development team in, in the community? So the first thing is, is kind of table stakes um, is uh, uh, tech talent. Um, and you, you need it in crypto no matter what, um, more than, than uh, in other types of companies perhaps. Um, and part of it is probably PTSD from seeing so many teams raise a ton of money without having the technical chops to execute and you know not wanting to be in in that situation um, so the first thing we we kind of have to make sure is that this team has the ability to execute and deliver on on what they're building um, the second thing is um, community and and you know that's that's a that's a broad term because it's there's the mechanical aspects of community management. You know, how often do you communicate? How often do you release updates? Do you engage with people on Twitter, or Reddit, or Telegram, or wherever your community lives? Um, but you also need something that's kind of harder to define. That's more of, you know, more of a talent for community, and that's where um, good leaders uh, are very important. People who can inspire large communities, people who can create a following behind them, and. I think that's kind of why we see networks that have really strong personalities behind them uh, succeed in the market um, because they're able to inspire that kind of, of reaction from people. And so you have that in Satoshi, you have that in Vitalik, and so on. Now, do you have any systems in place to support the teams of the projects that you're backing? Um, so not not much in the in the way of formal systems, uh, more than us the firm. Um, and part of the reason why we 
we want to stay small and, and um, kind of focused is so that we can spend um, as much of our time uh, working with teams uh, on whatever comes up. Um, but the, the three main areas that we focus on um, are uh, crypto economics, governance, and market infrastructure is where we're converging. And for the earlier stage teams, um, helping them design the crypto economics of a network, helping them um, brainstorm around them um, and find holes and so on is, is a big part of what we do. Um, helping teams figure out the right governance structures um, is also a big part of what we do. And that one is not just things like um, protocol governance or community governance, but also even in terms of how the team itself is structured, what corporate structure that they choose, do they have a foundation or not, where do they incorporate, which is a lot more mechanical and a lot more obscure. Um, but we get some economies of scale by being venture investors and investing in a lot of opportunities. We get to see what works in certain scenarios and what doesn't work in others. And oftentimes you have core developers who really don't have any knowledge of you know, corporate law or anything like that, but the, the way they structure themselves ends up making a big impact. And then the final uh, aspect, market infrastructure, is, is something that we actually debuted with Decred and then uh, added it to um, um, kind of our core work, which is uh, also another area where we get economies of scale uh, via our relationships, where we help teams um, build relationships with um, uh, custody providers or exchanges or market makers, um, and where we can kind of come in and leverage um, our relationships in the space to help teams scale. In 2016, you wrote your FAT protocol thesis, which, you know, goes into how the majority of the internet's built on application layers now, and you believe that protocols will, yeah. will take their place. Um, you want to go into that a little bit for sure. those that are unaware? Um, so it, it, it's more of an observation um, than anything else. And the observation uh, that I made in that post is that um, the, the traditional web has these um, protocols that are, that are crucial to the functionality of the web. Uh, these are TCP, things like TCP IP, SMTP for email, HTTP for web, and so on, uh, that are very limited in their functionality. Um, they do one thing, they do it well, they move packets around in, in predefined formats and they do nothing else. And these kind of very thin protocols uh, enabled all this innovation that we see, that we've seen in the web and has created the world's largest companies, um, which have built themselves into these kind of giant monopolies by way of, of monopolizing data largely. So you've got Google and Apple and Facebook and Amazon and, and all of those web companies that leverage these, these very thin protocols, um, but captured all of the value of those protocols. The HTTP by itself has no real financial value. TCP IP by itself has no real financial value. But the entire value of the web rides on these protocols. Uh, which are decentralized, and we have decentralized companies on top. The observation of FAT protocols was that we're, we're building a new kind of, of decentralized protocol with blockchains where um, the, the data actually lives in the protocol, and this is different from the web where the data lives in the applications. If you understand that data is really the, the ultimate source of value for information services, uh, like Google or like Decred and so on, then where the data lives determines where the value lives. And because we're building um, new decentralized protocols using a blockchain architecture as opposed to just a communications architecture like we do on the web, then it follows that most of the value gets captured at the protocol layer um, instead of at the application layer. And, and you kind of see that with, for example, a Bitcoin wallet um, or a crypto wallet. Um, I can move between crypto wallets pretty easily and still maintain all of my data, which in you know the financial use case, it's my transactions and my balances and so on. And that's different from the ways we interact with companies like Facebook, where you can't really leave Facebook because they have all the data. Um, and so you're locked into that user experience. You're locked into that, that application in a way that you're not locked into applications in crypto. And 
that is the, the, the key to the observation that value capture in crypto happens at the protocol layer more than it does at the application layer because there's less defensibility at the application layer because the data lives at the protocol layer. No single application has monopoly access to the underlying data that is distributed via blockchain. And that's not to say that there isn't value at the application layer. There's tremendous value at the application layer. I think Coinbase is a brilliant example of that, of a very, very valuable business that has been built at the application layer. It just so happens that the protocol layer is more valuable. Understood. Now, we know that Decred is one of the crypto assets that Placeholder holds. What is, um, what, what is, it, what is it about the project that made it attractive to Placeholder? So... Our history with Decred actually precedes Placeholder, and this is going back to, to that, that time um, prior to starting the firm uh, where Chris and I were spending a lot of time uh, thinking and talking about crypto, and we both um, um, became fans of Decred um, because of the, uh, the novel consensus mechanism. Um, and this was... Uh, at around the time that we were having the block size debate in, in BTC. And I, I wouldn't say that I was frustrated by the block size debate, but I certainly didn't have a voice. The, you know, I had an opinion, but the best I could do was complain about it on Twitter, on Reddit, and that was going to have no influence whatsoever on, on, on the decision. Um, and the idea that you could have a different consensus model where uh, the holders of, of the asset have... Have a have a right to participate in 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 the development of the network that was very attractive and it, it it felt similar to going back to the differences between venture and public markets you know you buy you buy some Amazon stock and you're a small investor you don't really have any you know rights or say into how that company is run uh, unless you you know buy a ton of that stock. Um, but in, in venture, we're used to taking board seats and participating actively in the governance of a company. And so this felt like a decentralized board. And so that, that spoke to me as a venture capitalist. Now, we know that Decred's aim is to be a store of value. How do you see projects like Decred and Bitcoin coexisting together in the space? I, I don't really buy into the idea that there's there's only one store of value in the world. And, and that's it. I, you know, you, you look at... at at the economy today, there's all there's thousands of different ways of storing value um, that coexist and that work for different use cases and have different profiles and they suit different people in different ways. Um, so you know, to to pick the the simplest and you know probably worst analogy is you have gold, silver, and bronze. You know, they coexist. They do different things. They have different production models. They have different industries built around them, and they work for different people in different ways. Um, but you also have um, different sides of, of, of the economy that, for example, you know, capital assets are a different way of storing value, and they, they're backed by, by different um, kind of value mechanisms um, and so on, or, or you know, land or anything like that. And so I think that there will be thousands, if not more, different ways of storing value in crypto, and they will all coexist. And there might be a power law that determines how much value is stored in, in different kinds of assets. Um, but I don't think we end up with one super asset that stores all the value in the world. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. What, what are some of the, the qualities within the Decred project that you find attractive? The main one is this commitment to um, community decision making, um, which is, is something that um, when Decred came along, this, the idea of unchained governance, the idea of, of users um, being involved in the decisions of the protocol was, was pretty new. Um, and over the last couple of years, we've seen that idea expand more broadly throughout the crypto market. Um, and there's a big debate about whether users really want to be involved in governance or not, whether people are actually voting or things like voter apathy and turnout and so on. And I care less about those things as, more as, uh, as much as I care about the right to participate. And you don't have to participate, right? You don't, you don't have to do it. You can just hold Decred and not really care about anything that's going on, but, 
but I think the most important thing is is that Decred is designed from the ground up, from its constitution up, as a network that enables user participation, and just having that right is is an important one. So now as the project grows, um, I feel like that's going to be the time when its governance mechanism is really going to be tested. The project is still small, and um, it's still growing. So how do you envision institutional players playing a role in Decred's governance system when that time comes? We're trying to figure that out um, because we are an institutional investor in, in Decred, and um, we, we, own, we own a bunch of Decred, um, which not, not too much, but you know, we're a dolphin, I think, uh, is, is the, the term. Um, <laughs> a I dolphin. <laughs> I don't know that, that we're quite whales. Maybe we are, but, but you know, we own a lot of Decred um, relative to the, to how, to the um, a voting consumer, participation. Yes. Yeah, and so we have, we have dis, uh, a disproportional amount of voting power. And so, you know, with great power comes great responsibility. And we, we haven't voted yet. We, we started uh, participating in staking uh, this year um, in small amounts. Uh, we uh, started a project with CoinFund um, where we set up a decret staking pool uh, called GrassFed. Um, and uh, there we we set up something that um, we consider kind of institutional ready staking. And, and the main reason is, you know, as an institutional investor, you have uh, more responsibilities. And so we wanted to do business with a staking pool that that we know um, uh, whose people we, we have good relationships with as opposed to an anonymous staking pool. Um, so we, we started working on that to precisely kind of figure out this question of what's the right level of participation. And now that uh, we have Mario uh, on the team getting more involved in governance research, uh, we're going to spend more time on Politea um, voicing our opinion. And um, I think there's, there's things where um, there, there's kinds of issues where it's probably best if we abstain from voting, something that's really contentious or something that um, you know, may be a little controversial, especially if we have a big vote. Um, and then there are things where it may be warranted for us to come in and be a tiebreaker. Um, and, and so we don't, the, the short answer is we don't know. Uh, the longer answer is we're, we're trying to figure that out. Would you consider Decred as an uncertainty hedge for investors? Because I feel that upgradability and adaptability is currently underpriced in the market with so many unknown challenges ahead. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, 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 I'm, I'm going to twist that and I'm going to reframe it as, you know, what is it, what is it for users more than investors? Because at the end of the day, you know, investors drive liquidity and value through the network and help sustain the network. But what determines ultimate success is, is users. And um, in, in a way, you, you can flip that around and think of it as a certainty hedge for users because of the governance model. One of the things that makes you know, the United States great or has made the United States great so far was that there was this, this trust in the way that the system was run, this trust in the governance model of the United States, which made it a very attractive place to do business, which made it a very attractive place um, to, to participate in, in this economy. Um, and now we're starting to see how when that trust model gets challenged, then uh, it has all these ripple effects in the way that people feel or the way the level of participation that people wish to have in, in the economy. Similarly for Decred, I think that uh, because it has such a well-defined governance model that defines the rights of the different participants so well and encodes them into the protocol and has this commitment um, to user participation, in a way it gives you certainty of how the network is going to function and how the network is going to evolve. And I think that's going to drive uh, usage to the network over the long term as people make decisions about where they want to build and where they want to participate. I could see it that way too. <laughs> <laughs> so let's see. Um, after being involved with the project so long, what are some of the holes that you see in the project or maybe some long-term concerns that, that you have with Decred? I think that um, we, we may be in for some growing pains on the community side. Um, and uh, as you mentioned earlier, the project is still young, still pretty early, um, and we're still 
in the process of rolling out all of these uh, governance mechanisms, which are, are quite mature, but we, we're still, um, for example, um, I know that there's a vote on Politea going on around uh, completely decentralizing the developer pool, which is a big deal because um, it puts it 100% in it's the hands a huge of the user. Yes. yes. And so we, we, we're rolling out, we're, we're kind of completing the governance stack of Decred uh, as we speak. Um, and then uh, that the, the reason it's a huge deal is because first it's important and second it means that um, the project is now almost completely at the whim of the community. And I think that uh, something that we haven't worked on as much in the Decred community is community standards and community ethics and um, what is what is our identity as a community? How do we communicate and creating kind of a cohesive personality for who we are? And the the reason you know the reason we don't have that yet, I think, is one, it's still small, right? And so it's easy to have an identity when you're small. Um, but as the network grows, it's going to be harder to maintain community cohesiveness. And uh, there's this um, more from the traditional uh, uh, venture capital world. Um, uh, a really good piece of advice for uh, companies that are growing very quickly is don't um, more than double your team in a given year because then you end up with more new people than old people and so that can that can make the culture of the company hard to manage. In a network, you have the same dynamic. Any, any period of time where you have explosive growth, you will end up with more new people than old people and so the, the culture is going to be affected by that. And if you don't have a strong kind of set of community guidelines and behaviors that kind of create rails in terms of how does this community behave, then you can have some issues. And so I think this is an area where the Decred community has to invest a little bit in uh, making sure that we communicate appropriately with each other, that we uh, behave appropriately with each other. Yeah, that definitely goes back to the stress testing we're going to have with growth. Yeah. And we'll, we're going to see if this experiment really plays out and, yeah. and how well built the governance structure yeah. is. So now let's flip that question. Um, what are you optimistic about when it comes to Decred's future? The thing that I'm most optimistic about in Decred is um, the governance model and the, the commitment to um, user control and community control. And I think that as the platform grows and users come to the platform and developers come to the platform, uh, there's a there's there's a different trust model that I think is going to enable certain kinds of applications, um, and so for example, you look at something like Politea, which is today used to manage Decred the project. Politea itself is actually technically very flexible and simple, so you could run other instances of Politea for other kinds of things that may or may not be other crypto networks or other kinds of communities, and so. This kind of um, going back to the analogy of uh, the U.S. government as, or you know, that model being really conducive to good business. I think this governance model is going to be conducive to to good governance applications. And the second th thing is the quality of the core team. I think out there uh, in the market, Decred has one of the absolute best protocol developer teams in the world. I think they're undermined. Absolutely. You know, um, I spend time undervalued. Correct. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, I spend time gathering articles and trying to educate um, some of the history of conformal systems and where Jake and Dave Collins came from. And um, even recently, I know Jake is going to appear on Laura Shin soon. And she had she kind of questioned if if Decred was going to come on the show. And I was like, hold on, like is, some, is someone missing a piece of history here? <laughs> it's, it's like, do you not know where they came from and the work that they did with BTC? And yeah. And, so, they're, they're amazing. Um, yeah, they're, I have they're to agree. absolutely incredible. Joel, um, going back to what you were saying with the growth of the community and, and it being one of your concerns, if you want to elaborate on that a little bit more and go into how you see the growing pains of the project. Sure. Um, so, you know, right now it's kind of easy to manage the Decred community because it's relatively small. Um, but I think there's a risk that we may be underinvesting in um, community rules and guidelines and setting um, kind of uh, a, a personality of the Decred community that, that people can kind of um, um, use as a, as a guideline for how to, how to communicate with each other and how to talk to each other um, and how to have discussions. 
And the reason is going back to this idea that you you will have periods of time where a lot lots of new people are coming to the project, and a you know you want guidelines so that they know how to behave and they know how to how to participate in a way that's useful, but also for the current community to be able to welcome those people in a way that's favorable and in a way that. Uh, um, embraces uh, new users as opposed to alienate them. And it's not that that's going on uh, in, in Decred per se, but um, you know, one of the things that I think we should, we should be working on is um, how do we handle proposals uh, that come into Politea from, from new users, from new people that are excited. And I have seen examples here and there of um, people who come to the network with good intentions and um, you know, make a proposal that may honestly not be a great proposal, um, but I have seen parts of the community kind of be rather hostile to, to that as opposed to constructive about it. Um, and so it's kind of tough because, you know, it, dep- it's, it, it depends on the situation and there's people who come in that, you know, are just not great and, you know, are, are disparaging. And so, um, you know, and that's bad. But you also have lots of people with good intentions that come in and, and, and may leave with, with some... Um, Kind of disappointment about how their thoughts and opinions are handled. Um, so I think that's that's an area that we could we could be spending some resources on. What would that framework look like? So if you look at any any large web community like Reddit, um, as poorly as that may be perceived as being managed, uh, or Hacker News, or Quora even, or things like that, or Stack Overflow, there's there's a strict set of community guidelines of how do you speak, how do you comment, um, uh, what are things that you can and cannot say. And the reason this is this is really difficult is that one of the biggest principles in Decred is um, you know, the right to free speech and First Amendment, and you absolutely do not want to alienate that. So you know what you can and cannot say will be controversial, um, but it's more about how you say it. And um, so, you know, I think that if we can work towards a set of, of community guidelines that it's not about censorship and it's not about, um, you know, infringing upon people's rights to free speech, but more about um, kind of the, the ethics and behavior of how we communicate with each other, I think that would be a good investment to make. So this is great that you brought this up because I, at times, speak out to certain community members and there are behaviors that I find in poor taste. It's probably the best way I could describe it. So one of the most attractive things to me about the project is that the project leads are silent. They don't pump. They really don't have a voice. They just do the work, you know? And some of the behaviors that I find um, unattractive is when, whenever there's a moment where there's, there's a certain situation where Decred shines over another project and then that's put in people's faces. Mm. It's almost like, mm-hmm. r- remain humble. We may have qualities over another project, but there's no mm-hmm. need to go out and, and put that out there. I believe that that creates mm-hmm. um, just not the, the kind of energy or, or, or behavior that, yeah. that, that is wanted or when there's times where we attack a maximalist. Right. You know, it's almost like there's, just like what we discussed before, there's going to be more than one store value. Yeah. So, so, I believe that the way that we should speak is by delivering. And that's one of the most attractive things about Decred because we do that. You know, we have dates, we have our roadmap. It may take long for some things to come into place, but we've delivered every time so far. Yeah. Yeah, there's, um, you know, there was a case of um, a proposal that was made, and I forget what the, what the specifics of that proposal was, um, but it was by a new community member who... Um, who was kind of pretty reputable outside Decred, right? Just like a generally a, a, a person with, with a successful career and, you know, who's been in crypto now for a while, et cetera, uh, who made a proposal. And one of the comments was, well, I'm not going to back a proposal by someone that I don't know. And it's like, well, the whole point of Politea is to enable anyone to come in and participate. And so I think that we, we, we can invest in the on-ramp uh, for ideas, um, because you, you, you don't want a situation where someone comes in, is new, doesn't know a lot of people, but has a good idea, and then gets shut down by the community um, for kind of arbitrary reasons. There should be an acclimation process, though. Like, they should come in and interact with the community yes. and, and build 
a reputation yes. amongst the community before even proposing. And that's something you can put in the guidelines, right? Yeah. Like that is exactly... I think the guidelines is an excellent idea. Richard Red could definitely tackle that. So now I'm going to get into the Decred Bulletproof section. And um, this is a set of statements, um, some questions that I gathered from Twitter and kind of put together. And I, I want to get everybody's take that I interview on these to see what they think. Great. I'm off Twitter, so this, is, this will be fun for me. Perfect. So if Decred was to fail, what would be the cause of its death? Growing pains on the community side, I think. Hmm. So some say it's good for it to be difficult to make changes to consensus. Decred does nothing special other than draw focus to a specific activation method baked into the protocol layer, which can be ported into any other project. Your thoughts? That's probably correct, but I think it undermines the actual value of that activation mechanism. Um, you know, I, I don't think it's a small deal. I think it's a big deal. Hmm. Bitcoin launched without a pre-mine. All other projects outside of Bitcoin are built around the financial interest of their creators. Which is an issue I see. I mean, I... So it... I honestly don't see anything wrong with that. Th th that, that sounds like it was uh, tweeted by a maximalist. Um, Most of these were. <laughs> um, but... Um, so I think all projects are kind of created around the financial interest of their creators. Um, so I think that's, that's probably true, um, perhaps with the rare exception of, of, of Satoshi, which we don't know. Bitcoin right? is not so a scam can't. yet. Yeah. <laughs> we don't know. Um, yeah, taken from Crystal but, Rose. You know. <laughs> um, but I'm a venture capitalist, which means that I'm a capitalist, which means that I invest in things uh, and companies that are created out of the financial interest of their creators. I don't. Th I think that's a feature of capitalism, not a bug. Now, the criticism I think is geared towards um, projects that uh, set up the economics unfairly in favor of the creators or scams and things like that, where Correct. it's just pump and dumps, etc. And those are absolutely deplorable. Um, but I don't think there's anything wrong with people embarking on ambitious ventures with a financial interest of, for themselves as long as they create it in such a way that also creates a lot of value to the world. And I think that's fundamentally the way that capitalism is set up. There's a bunch of issues with capitalism that we don't have time to get into, but by and large, it has been a net positive for society. And I think that that's, that's a key feature, the fact that people can go out and do things for their own financial interests that end up creating a lot of value. I personally find the value in leadership and transparency hmm. when it comes to that. And I believe Decred has yeah. those two places. And you, if, you, if you have a good leader, you want them to be incentivized, right? You want them to. I agree. Yeah. So to me, it's less about who has a financial interest. I think one of the best features of crypto is that in these networks where you have these crypto assets circulating, everyone can participate in the financial interest. The setup matters more. And this is why I say that we focus on crypto economic and governance, crypto economics and governance, because part of governance is the setup of the team and who's incentivized for how long to do what, um, you know, how do lockups work and things like that. Um, so to us, it's more about how, it, how it's distributed more than people having a financial interest. There's nothing wrong with that. So here we, I agree. So here we have another statement. People will invest in things that make the world better. Whether it be time or money, they will invest. You don't need a dev fund embedded into your protocol to incentivize development. Making the world a better place is a pretty strong incentive. Yeah. Um, just making the world a better place is not going to put food on the table. Um, you know, think that uh, we have had so many examples of um, networks um, who, for various reasons at different points in time, have had funding problems um, and have struggled with. Um, now, you know, it's, it's kind of tough because you have um, you have a lot of uh, nuances there. Like, you know, you have teams who raised a bunch of money and then there was a crypto crash and then they lost all that money and they had to figure out how to fund themselves and things like that. Um, so, you know, I think that having a sustainable uh, model for continuously funding development is a good idea. Um, and, you know, going back to that statement, um, the incentive is to make the world a better place. Um, but, you know, you got to pay for that somehow. 
Um, and I think the debt fund gives us the opportunity to make sure that we can always fund uh, growth and development and that we can have full-time people working on these things uh, as opposed to you having to have a job elsewhere and then you know do something on the side. Um, give me your closing thoughts and a message to newcomers and potential stakeholders. I would say spend time reading the documentation. Um, the, and, and the reason I say that is because, for example, very few people know that Decred has a constitution. And, and it's an amazing document. And there's votes... Which was just revised. I know. And, you know, when you, when you spend time reading the documentation and then, you know, just poke around Politea and just poke around the way decisions are made and, and the way um, uh, the community is managed. And, and I, think it's, I think it's very inspiring because it's, it's, it's still rather small um, but you know when you when you read all the stuff and then kind of sit back for a couple of weeks and, and digest it 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 turns out to be a pretty big deal well Joe thank you for coming on the show and taking the time thank you Angela